Perhaps you've always dreamed of luxury, that rare blend of impossible elegance. Like this handbag, for example. Beautiful, isn't it? Yes, but it comes with a price. Then again, can we put a price on luxury? Who knows, one day you might just splash out and buy this little beauty, taking the view that it's worth every penny, because behind the price tag, there are real people involved. A well-trained craftsman who works day in, day out, honing his skills. An artist, even with unparalleled expertise, employed by big brands, sorry, by fashion houses, who are fair and ethical, respectful of workers and clients alike. This is the idea that many of us have. But luxury in 2017 is also a $300 million international market. World famous brands whose shops populate the most beautiful avenues of major capital cities. But behind the glamorous exterior, all that glitters is not gold. The back rooms of these luxury boutiques are hidden away on the other side of the Alps, in the heart of Tuscany. Hundreds of suppliers tanning leather for world-famous brands. With subcontracting galore, employees are overworked, or in this case, far worse. During our filming, we met some questionable bosses. We also investigated the role of industrial lobbies in a world of luxury goods that is far less glamorous than it might seem. Finally, we traced the Italian brand Max Mara all the way back to China. What we discovered there will send shivers down your spine. Far from the glossy fashion magazine spreads, welcome to a rather chilling industry. We began our investigation on our home turf. After all, being in France, we have Paris. And in Paris, we have Fashion Week. But of course, you know all about Fashion Week. Star-studded catwalk shows. And some wannabe stars. Fashion Week is an opportunity to see all sorts, like this cape-clad woman strutting down the street as if it were a runway. Here's another fashionista with pink hair. She filmed us while we were filming her. How about this gentleman who loves fashion and clearly 80s ice hockey? But above all, Fashion Week is an intense week of runway shows. With a no, no, no theme at Dior, Gucci's dental chic with glitter, happy smiling faces at Louis Vuitton. But it wasn't really the clothes that stood out to us. Have you noticed what each of the models is carrying? Handbags, of all shapes and sizes and at all prices, starting at $1,350. Accessories are more popular than ever. You only need to look at the figures. Take some of the major French brands, for example. We calculated the sales revenue from items such as handbags, wallets and shoes. In short, leather goods. Here are the results. For Gucci, 74% of the brand's total revenue. For Yves Saint Laurent, 72%. 60% for Hermès. Voila. You get the picture. In the world of luxury goods, leather means record-breaking profits.
But where does this luxurious leather come from? According to our information, most of this raw material is tanned in Italy. We call up each tannery one by one. It takes a while. There are 700 in total. And we ask the same question each time. But some of the companies do play ball. And 700 phone calls later, our map of luxury suppliers is starting to take shape. The phone calls have brought one surprising detail to our attention. All of these tanneries and subcontractors are located in one small area of Tuscany, just 36 square kilometers. Tuscan tanneries working with luxury leather. A pretty picture, right? The vineyards, the city of Florence, the mythical Arno River. Well, let's get rid of that notion. Follow the river upstream to muddier waters. On the grey banks of the river Arno, we find the leather district. Wedged along this highway that links Florence and Pisa, how did we know which exit to take? We just followed our senses. Or more specifically, the smell of rotten eggs that permeates the whole area. Welcome to Santa Croce sul Arno. A noticeably less glamorous world than the luxury catwalks of Paris where workers are not easily approachable. Clearly a rather secretive place. These are the luxury leather tanneries. They generate over a billion dollars in revenue each year and employ over 7,000 people. A small, very profitable part of Italy. We have been given permission to visit one of these tanneries. It's one of the largest in the region, the Zabri Tannery. Carlo Rovini is the owner's right-hand man. He will be our tour guide. He starts us off with the crown jewel, the showroom. Finished products sent from the leather district. Tanned animal skins printed, pressed and sold by the square meter. These will henceforth be used in major brands' manufacturing workshops to make handbags, belts and shoes. Parmi les grands groupes, euh, les grandes marques qui font un peu rêver, vous, vous travaillez pour qui Marques, brands américains, français, italiens. Nous travaillons un peu avec... Euh... Oserei dire quasi tutte, tutte le maggiori brand internazionali. Kenzo, Tots, Polar of Lauren, Tom Hilfiger, Louis Vuitton, Chloe, uh, Isabel Rovini is as proud as a peacock. Prestigious clients, happy employees, a tannery that's spick and span and state-of-the-art equipment. Frankly, we were won over by our day at Zabri. Except that here they only perform the final stages of the tanning process, the rather more pleasant ones. Upstream, there's a whole chain of subcontractors carrying out dozens of tasks, more thankless tasks, allow us to explain. At the start of its life, a handbag looks like this. Next, the cowskin must be removed, with mountains of coarse salt poured on top of it to preserve it. Then the cowhides are sent to the tanneries to begin a long, multi-stage process. 
During one of these stages, they are put into a kind of cement mixer along with hydrogen sulfide to remove all the fur. This is what produces the rotten egg smell that lingers throughout the area. They are then transferred to these big drums and soaked with chromium salts to stop the decomposition process. They are left out to dry and then soaked again to soften, then re-dried, then soaked again. We'll spare you the details of the other 30 stages, but they are rather unpleasant and quite painful. Now that you've understood the huge number of stages involved and the number of subcontractors needed, let's go back to Zabri. Remember that the tannery claims to work for the LVMH Group and its luxury brand Kenzo. LVMH, the number one luxury goods conglomerate in the world, has developed a fairly strict code of conduct. No illegal or undeclared work. No excessive overtime. A duty to provide workers with a safe environment to reduce the risk of accidents in the workplace. All of the luxury giants have codes of conduct just like this one that supposedly apply to their suppliers and any subcontractors hired by their suppliers. Comment uh, vous faites pour contrôler absolument tout, par exemple, la peau qui vient de chez vous, mm -hmm. euh, vos sous-traitants C'est impossible. Comment vous faites pour vous assurer que de A à Z, Alors, tout est parfait Client fa chiede a me un capitolato, io lo chiedo al mio al mio sous-traitant, come si dice. Quindi eh, io obbligo il mio uh, fabbricante o i nostri partner a rispettare determinate regole. Zabri, votre société, fait signer aussi aux sous-traitants des, des engagements en fait pour que les sous-traitants fassent tout correctement en termes de droit du travail, euh, de humain, etc. It may well be standard, but Carlo Rovini would not actually show us these agreements. Shame, we'll have to take his word for it. It seems like everything is under control in the world of luxury fashion. Every link in the chain is squeaky clean. And so we continue on our journey into this enchanting world. Good news, one of Zabri's subcontractors, Thermoplaque, has agreed to let us visit. Meet the boss. His name is Alfonso Guerra. <laughs> Thermoplaque specializes in drying animal skins. Large tanneries working for luxury brands such as Zabri send their leather here. Each animal hide weighs between 15 and 30 kilos. Workers carry hundreds of them every day. Most of the employees here are Senegalese, and Alfonso Guerra has a funny way of speaking about them. Because they have no fame. Senegalese has a character compatible. Perché è una, la loro religione è una religione tranquilla, vogliono lavorare, non, non bevono, non bevano, non fumano, lavorano. Qui c'è un po' di problema quando c'è il Ramadan, perché stanno quando è un mese senza mangiare, allora il giorno li vedi un po'. Perhaps the problem, more so than Ramadan, is the work environment. Temperatures inside the factory can reach up to 45 degrees. Alfonso Guerra is not the only one hiring Senegalese employees. You only have to come to the leather district in the early hours of the morning to see them. Hundreds of unskilled workers, whose jobs in the luxury goods sector are far from secure. This is what we are about to discover through the documents in this briefcase. Confidential data about the working conditions inside the tanneries. First up, temporary workers. Here are hundreds of short-term contracts, signed off by various companies. But whilst some are temporary, others are much more long-term, from 208-day contracts to 215 days or even 366 days. 
According to trade unions, 36% of these workers are on temporary contracts, six times more than in the French tanneries. And that's not all. An internal document from the Occupational Health Care Department lists accidents at work by nationality. According to our calculations, foreign workers are affected twice as much as Italian workers. At the Department of Occupational Health, Dr. Iaia is in charge of the tannery sector. She has been fighting for employee health and safety for the past 15 years. According to her, there is a direct link between short-term contracts and accidents at work. Questi lavoratori ormai <laughs> vengono assunti per una settimana, un giorno, anche un'ora. Il lavoratore straniero che spesso entra adesso nelle concerie con un rapporto di somministrazione lavoro non ha la possibilità di eh, farsi un'esperienza personale e rende oltretutto questi lavoratori molto più suscettibili a, 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 diciamo, all'evento infortunistico. So how is the issue of health and safety addressed at Thermoplac? All day, workers are handling animal skins soaked in chemicals. Alfonso Guerra, the perfect boss, claims that he takes it upon himself to provide protective equipment. Who buys the protection for the workers? It's not that we don't trust him, but we feel we need to hear another perspective. So, under the pretext of exploring the factory, we take the opportunity to ask a few questions, filming with our hidden camera. The boss's son has come to intervene. In a factory like this, there is always a risk of accidents occurring. Fortunately, each machine has its own safety features. The law demands it. Have you ever had an accident here? There was a lot of accidents for human beings. Maybe a little bit of stagnation, or in the morning, a little bit of sleep, but nothing is really grave. So, you don't have any amputation? No, no, no. That's why I'm favorable to the security. We're finding it harder and harder to believe Alfonso Guerra. After several days in Santa Croce, we gained the trust of an ex termo plaque worker. We meet with him one evening, bringing along our Italian interpreter. This man worked at termo plaque in 2014 and claims that the boss, Alfonso Guerra, would sometimes disable the safety mechanisms on the machines to increase productivity. He lost three knuckles. He agrees to talk to us as a witness, provided he can remain anonymous. C'est la première fois que je travaille. Je l'ai pris, je l'ai mise. J'ai appuyé sur les pédales. Et la lame a bloqué. La première fois, ça a bloqué. Alors, j'ai retourné. J'ai remis la peau. J'ai pédalé. Et ça a pris. Comme ça. Il a dit quoi le responsable comme excuse Il a dit qu'il est tombé 
Il a tombé une planche sur mes doigts et ça, ça a coupé les doigts. On ne pensait plus personne. We met Czech and Fody just two months after they had left Tamilplak. This is what they claim to have received as a leaving present, a violent beating for having dared to demand payment. According to them, this was the work of Alfonso Guerra along with one of his sons. <laughs> Poi sono venuto qui e ho trovato eh, quello stronzo di Alfonso, qui con il suo figliolo, capito? E altri sei persone, avevano bastoni, ferri, cortelli, tutto. Poi abbiamo mano aggressato con lui, capito, mio amico. Quando è venuto io mi hanno colpito un bastone di ferro. According to Czech, the attackers beat him until he fell to the ground unconscious. His friend Fodi was also hurt. He beat me here, here, my leg, after me, after running. Yeah, after I running. How was after your skip. How was your leg? Did so, you get hurt? No, no, yeah, it's pain. Fodi and Czech reported the incident the very next day, but Alfonso Guerra and his son have still not been called in for investigation. The two young men claimed they were undeclared workers and were forced to work under gruelling conditions at Tamilplak. <laughs> che lì non puoi, non puoi andare a pisciare, né bagno, non puoi fare nulla. Se tu vuoi pisciare, giri dietro la macchina dove, dove, dove lavori, pisci lì, capito? Entri alle 5 di mattina e smetti alle eh, mezzogiorno, entri alle 1 e smetti alle 7 di sera, fai 13 ore il giorno. Quello, quello senegalese che lavora lì, lui, lui non lo paga. Non paga proprio. Since our meeting with Czech and Fordy, Alfonso Guerra is said to have physically abused another one of his employees. As far as we know, he has still not been prosecuted. A few weeks later, we go back to Tamil Plank to see the boss. However, this time, we are not so well received. Ciao, Alfonso. Alfonso, sono Zoe. Sì. Come, come stai? Bene. Tutto bene? Ho detto di no, per cortesia. Ma a, abbiamo... No, no, non abbiamo niente. Okay, okay, va bene, va bene. Ok, va bene. One of his sons quickly intervenes. Va bene, è, è chiuso, ok? È chiuso. And then another comes along, despite the frosty reception. We attempt to ask about Fordy and check. Un momento. Due persone che mi hanno detto che ci sono problemi. È vero o non è vero? Lei sta facendo così, va. È vero o non è vero? Fatti tua, vai via. È vero o non è vero? Per favore. Non è vero un cazzo, fatti cazzi tua. Sta riprendendo. Fatti cazzi tua. Per favore. È vero o non è vero? È vero o non è vero? Fatti cazzi subito. Eh, eh, eh. Doucement, doucement, doucement. Doucement, arrête. Doucement. Entre, entre, entre. Violent bosses, arduous working conditions in the elegant world of luxury fashion. We did not expect this. Fortunately, Italy has its labor inspectorate. Surely they must be on the case. The problem is that according to our information, they don't tend to visit the tanneries very often. Ever since Riccardo Spella was appointed at the end of 2014, there has been a dramatic decline in the number of inspections in the leather district. 26 entreprises inspectées entre 2014 et 2017, donc j'ai fait le calcul, ça fait moins de 8 par an. Rien que pour l'année 2011, il y en avait eu 104. Comment vous expliquez une telle baisse des inspections Ora, io nel 2011 non so, non posso sapere le motivazioni precise, però nel corso degli anni, chiaramente le direttive cambiano. 
i target cambiano, il numero degli ispettori cambia. È chiaro che noi in, dal 2011 in poi abbiamo avuto anche altre emergenze ben più importanti. We only have one pressing issue to address here on our tablet. Eh, quello di Alfonso, avevano bastoni, ferri, cortelli, tutto. Poi abbiamo mannaggiato, egressato con lui, capito, mio amico. Questo caso io non lo conosco. Connaissez pas ce cas? Non, io non lo conosco questo caso. Cette entreprise, elle est connue dans tout le secteur comme étant une entreprise particulièrement problématique et peu vertueuse avec ses employés. Le cas dont je vous parle, il a été l'objet de nombreux articles dans la presse locale. Est-ce qu'il est normal qu'avec tout ça, vos services ne soient pas intervenus dans cette entreprise pour se dire, bon, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas un problème quand même là-bas Répète, ci sono à canto à noi. Allora, tu, nessuno ha visto niente. Io, istituzionalmente, c'è un ispettore, posso, sta qua. Donc, ça veut dire che là, après aujourd'hui, vous n'allez rien déclencher. Sauf si l'un de ces deux jeunes, qui s'est fait frapper, ne fait pas 50 km pour venir vous voir et, et vous alerter. Sono convinto che, che il, il modo di comportarsi di questo ufficio che deve essere che è chiaramente migliorabile in tutti i casi, eh, deve, sia comunque sempre stato sufficiente, anzi forse più che sufficiente. Well, if everything's just fine around here, apologies for the inconvenience. One small thing before we go, if you want to file a complaint against your boss and you travel 30 miles to inform the Labour Inspectorate, make sure you don't get caught out by the office hours. Open Monday to Friday from 9am to 12.15pm and Monday and Wednesday from 3 to 4pm. And what about the contracting party? Are there no sanctions for them? Is Zabri, the model tannery claiming to work for LVMH, aware of the violent acts allegedly committed by its subcontractor? Because remember, Zabri and Temoplag work hand in hand. We go back to meet Carlo Rovini to question him about the behavior of his subcontractor. <laughs> Euh, alors, euh, c'est vrai que nous, ont, nous sommes en train de, de changer des choses mm -hmm. avec euh, les sous-traitants. Comme vous, vous, êtes, vous, êtes, vous aviez dit que vous étiez garant de vos sous-traitants si. Que vous étiez responsable Oui, nous, 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 Vous, vous ne devez pas vous non, assurer que tout va bien Non, que nous devons nous assurer que tout va bien. Mais si nous, nous ne pouvons pas nous ou pour le moins, je sais que c'est un peu difficile de savoir si nous devons nous payer ou non. Normalement, si il y a des problèmes, la première chose que normalement se fait est d'aller à dénoncer respect à notre travail, à l'ASL, à la carabinière, à tout ça, si il y a des irrégularités. Ah, complaining to the authorities. Great idea. We've seen how well that works. What do those at the end of the supply chain think about this situation? We asked for an interview with the LVMH group, but they refused. All we received were emails stating the following. With regards to Kenzo, we barely see any sign in our books of the company receiving leather from the Zabri tannery. Yet, when we ask Zabri, they maintain that this is one of their most important partnerships. Kenzo must definitely use our leather in their products. In recent years, we have made five, six, seven annual shipments directly to Kenzo. We have a long-standing working relationship. For at least the past three years, people have been aware of the sorts of problems taking place in Italian tanneries, short-term contracts, accidents at work, ever since one man brought these issues to light. 
He lives in the Tuscan countryside, an hour's drive away from Santa Croce. His name is Francesco Gisuardi. He is the president of an Italian NGO, fighting for fair labor conditions for some of the poorest workers, and has written a report called A Tough Story of Leather. This report was authorized and funded by the European Commission. Its publication will no doubt provoke the wrath of many leather manufacturers. Tout ce qu'on avait écrit, ce n'était pas vrai, que c'était faux, qu'il y avait je ne sais pas combien d'erreurs. Euh, enfin, ils allaient dénigrer le, le rapport, mm -hmm. hein, qui disait on, on voit bien qu'il a été fait par des gens incompétents, qui ne connaissent pas le secteur, et qui ont dit beaucoup de stupidité, on dit comme ça. Mm -hmm. Voilà. A group of manufacturers asked the European Commission to call in the authors of the report. In spring 2016, two meetings were organized in Brussels. With one man at the helm, Gustavo Gonzalez, representing Cotons, the European leather lobby. Il y avait surtout le, le, le type de Cotons qui parlait pour l'association la, de, de Tonnerre. Et il disait il faut que le rapport eh, sorte définitivement de circulation. Et le rôle de la Commission européenne là-dedans Et voilà, le rôle étrange de la Commission européenne, ce n'était pas de dire, OK, OK, allons voir qui a raison entre les données. Non, mais ils ont pris la défense des tonnerres. A report backed by Brussels that they themselves later rejected. The European Commission won over by leather lobbyists. It seems like this story is well worth a trip to Belgium. Despite numerous email exchanges, Cotence's Secretary General, Gustavo Gonzalez, refused to meet with us, so we decided to pay him a surprise visit. Vous êtes Monsieur Gonzalez Oui. Je voulais vous poser des questions parce qu'on était en tournage à Centre Crotier. Oui, oui, oui. Oui, 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 attention, monsieur. Doucement, doucement. Oh, non, doucement, monsieur. Non, pas, eh, pas de violence, on n'est pas violent, monsieur. Doucement. Aucune violence, monsieur, s'il vous plaît. On n'est pas violent. Je ne suis pas violent. Non, non, non mais parce que vous, vous, avez pas, failli, mais... vous avez failli faire tomber mon caméraman. C'est pour ça que je dis ça. Non, juste. vous avez failli me faire tomber à moi. Non, pas du tout. Mais on revient de Santa Croce en, en Italie. On était en tournage. Et on a constaté du travail au noir, des heures supplémentaires en pagaille, des accidents du travail qui n'étaient pas déclarés. Vous connaissez ce rapport, j'imagine. Vous l'avez eu entre les mains. A Tough Story of Leather. Euh, donc, euh, il a été publié en 2016 et, euh, et il pointe les mauvaises pratiques de certaines tanneries dans le secteur de Santa Croce. Il y est écrit que les travailleurs immigrés sont deux fois plus victimes d'accidents du travail que les travailleurs italiens. Est-ce que vous, vous trouvez ça normal Pardon. Vous voulez que je répète ma question Oui. D'accord. Donc, dans ce rapport qui est ici... Mmh. A tough story of leather. Oui. Il est écrit que les travailleurs immigrés sont deux fois plus victimes d'accidents du travail que les travailleurs italiens. Donc, est-ce que vous trouvez cette situation normale Vous pouvez répéter la question Ah ben, je vais la répéter autant que vous voulez. Donc, ce rapport de 2016 qui pointe les mauvaises pratiques de certaines tanneries dans le secteur de Santa Croce. Et il y est écrit, et je peux vous montrer les chiffres, euh, que les travailleurs immigrés sont deux fois plus victimes d'accidents du travail que les travailleurs italiens. Travailleurs immigrés, deux fois plus d'accidents du travail que les travailleurs italiens. Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez Est-ce que vous trouvez ça normal Vous pouvez répéter la question Vous ne voulez pas me répondre ou... Non, non, c'est que, tout d'abord, ce tough story about leather oui. a été dénoncé parce qu'il comportait des informations qui étaient des fake news. Oui, mais alors là, ce n'est pas des fake news parce que ça s'appuie sur les chiffres de la médecine du travail et sur une période de 5 ans. Ou alors vous sur la médecine du travail Oui, et, et pendant 5 ans. Sur une période ans. de 5 ans Oui. Non, ça, je peux vous assurer que ce n'est pas le cas. Si, c'est le cas, monsieur. Pardonnez-moi, monsieur Gonzalez. Mais sur ces si, chiffres-là. Si, si vous vous basez sur quelque chose qui a été démenti, désautorisé, parce qu'il euh, comportait des fake news. Euh... Alors, désautorisé, d'après, comme vous dites, hein, mais d'après nos informations, ce n'est pas ça. C'est vous qui auriez tenté de, de faire étouffer ce rapport, en fait. Comment oui, c'est vous qui aurez tenté de faire étouffer. Oui, c'est ce avons, que nous ont nous dit les ONG. La, 
la vérité sur les mensonges qui ont été présentés. Donc pour vous, est-ce que, est -ce que cette affirmation est un mensonge C'est-à-dire, quand on dit que sur une période de 5 ans, avec les chiffres de la médecine du travail, il y a deux fois plus d'accidents pour les travailleurs immigrés que pour les travailleurs italiens, est-ce que vous, vous démentez ces chiffres Je ne crois pas que c'est correct. Mais vous ne croyez pas ou... parce que Non, non, parce que ce ne sont pas les chiffres de la médecine du travail. Là, vous contestez vous ces chiffres, mais est-ce que c'est vous, oui ou non, qui avez saisi la commission pour que ce rapport soit retiré d'Internet Oui. Parce qu'il est, qu est mensonger. Est-ce qu'il est mensonger sur le fait qu'il y a deux fois plus d'accidents du travail sur les travailleurs immigrés que sur les travailleurs italiens Ça, c'est à vérifier. Vous ne savez pas Non, non. Je, 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 vous, vous êtes en train de faire ici des élaborations sur des chiffres. Alors, il, Moi, est... il, faut, il faut que je vérifie. Alors, hein. Il est mensonger sur quoi Dites-moi sur quoi il est mensonger. Madame, c'est toute une liste de points qui ont été, qui ont été présentés à la commission. Lesquels je ne me rappelle plus tous les points individuels qui ont été faits pour démontrer que c'est ce un rapport mensonger. Il y en a au moins un ou deux que vous avez en tête, non Des points mensongers. <rire> Madame, je deviens vieux. Vous n'avez pas l'air. <rire> enfin, écoutez, merci beaucoup, M. Gonzalez. Euh, moi, si, quand vous voulez, vous voulez une interview au calme, tranquillement, posée dans un bureau, c'est quand vous voulez. Bonne journée. <rire> When it comes to big fashion houses and their leather, getting answers is decidedly difficult. But what about fur, the other iconic luxury material? Vincennes, ironie cruelle pour les pensionnaires du zoo, Madame André Leroy présente ici même ses dernières créations. Fur has been popular since as far back as the 1950s. Un manteau de kangourou. Et souhaitons à ce poney de ne pas se transformer un jour lui aussi en manteau. 20 years on, starry-eyed spectators look on admiringly at fur coats on the runway. At that time, people thought fur was sourced by trappers, brave souls who ventured out into the cold searching for animals. Oh, c'est un bout. Femelle. Une femelle Une femelle. Ah, femelle. Okay. Ah, bah, c'est bien. Ça fait du bon boulot, Jean-Marc. Since then, most fur comes from animals that are bred specifically for this purpose. And the trappers are no longer Québécois. They're from China. China is the world's top fur producer. If you really want to see what this industry looks like, you need to go to Daing. In the vast expanse of China, Daing is a very small town, home to 100,000 residents and 10,000 businesses, all linked to fur. There are shopping malls full of fur coats and slippers. There's the mink fur showroom. And most importantly, we have the city's emblem, the fox. How ironic. You can also go to the fur market three times a month. Tens of thousands of animal skins, all different shapes and sizes. <laughs> at ridiculously low prices. <laughs> 25 yuans, that's just over $3 per animal skin. In China, 70 million animals are killed for their fur each year, and animal welfare isn't the country's top priority. Chi Tzu Ching works for PETA, the world-famous NGO best known for its crackdowns on fur.
This young activist is at the forefront of the fight against fur in China, a country which is now Peter's top priority. Uh can you describe the hygiene there? Uh, I, I don't know if I'm clear with that. Tamda Nyao Gun Da just Tam the Pai Siu Chi Chuza Tam the Long Sam Jiao Do Tiza. Rao Tang even Mail show it the Jiao, so it Tam Bao Lu Zai Wai Mi, just Kaishon Sin the Shanko, uh Ye Dosh Tang Tang Hui Zai Wai Mi, even Tam Hoyo Jing Sun the Chi Bing Zai Zam Shasha the Kung Jin, so it Tam Tang Tang Ye Hoyo Pang Bian just go beats a quick gong ji the drunk kwang, rao hun do woman can dollar shipping lit me, do you tam that yao shi tam the tong 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 ban the drunk kwang. So he 你一進去那個環境,接下來你們看到可能就是會有很強的那個安德威道,因為那個就是他們的排洩物,也不會有醫療團隊不會有人在去清清理。But which companies do these farms work for? Do major European brands use them? In this luxury fashion mall in Beijing, there's plenty of choice of fur. Fur cuffs, scarves, or these strange looking fluff balls to be clipped onto bags. With our hidden camera, we head into Fula, an Italian brand. But when it comes to knowing where the fur comes from, things are a little more complicated. We have the same problem in all the shops we visit. It's never quite clear where the fur has come from. We head to Max Mara, another Italian brand, with 2,600 stores worldwide. We even try on this lovely little jacket. Italian fur. That's the first version we are told. Next, the store manager comes over. Italian fur, or rather Danish fur, or maybe we're not so sure anymore. After leaving the mall, we decide to go straight to the source. We email Max Mara's customer service, pretending to be a client, and ask them directly. This was their response. We would like to inform you that our company is firmly committed to a process of continuous growth and improvement of our products, regardless of where they are manufactured. Furthermore, with regards to our fur, we can confirm that we only source from certified suppliers. The answer is not very clear. To move forward with our investigation, we have no choice but to take a new approach. We head back to Daying, fur city following the trail of the Max Mara rabbit fur jacket. But this time we are posing as fashion designers. We've even created a portfolio. From now on, we will be filming discreetly, sometimes with a hidden camera. We will go around factories making connections, talking sketches and the ordering process. But we cannot seem to find anyone working for Max Mara. 
Then one morning, across this courtyard, we stumble upon a clothing manufacturer. Bingo! We finally found the rabbit fur jackets of this luxury Italian brand. The boss is extremely proud of his Max Mara connections. We'll call him Mr. Lee. That day, inside the factory, employees are working on another model for the Italian brand. So our Max Mara jacket is not made of Italian or Danish fur, it is from China. We finally have our answer, but this is just the beginning. We've still not found the exact breeding farms. And we are yet to convince the boss to introduce us to his suppliers. We are not off to a good start. Mr. Lee only knows of one tannery where he sources his fur. After two hours of negotiating, he finally gives us the go ahead. Huasi is 250 kilometers north of Daying. Another town that is all about fur. Wasi is home to the country's largest tannery. At the entrance, piles of raccoon furs lie drying in the sun. And further on, thousands of rabbit skins. Three thousand employees work in this factory, immersed in the nauseating stench of rotting carcasses. The animal skins arrive from all over the country and sometimes even from northern Europe. <laughs> Another part of the factory is dedicated solely to rabbits, or at least what remains of them. To ease the workers' load in this factory, all tools are state-of-the-art. These workers, and above all their salary, are one of the secrets behind our beloved Max Mara jacket. Our interpreter talks discreetly to one of the employees. <laughs> 200 Chinese yuan, barely $30 a day, not even minimum wage in China. Let's go back to the rabbits. At the back of the factory, we find the furs set aside for Mr. Lee. 
Alors c'est là-dedans que vous faites votre choix pour Max Mara Et vous en achetez combien par an en tout pour Max Mara Mr. Lee finally tells us where he gets his fur from. Vous avez l'air de vraiment apprécier la fourrure de Ligny. This is Mr. Lee's trade merchant. He is the one who buys the fur for Max Mara in the more remote provinces. If we want to visit the rabbit breeding farms, it is him we have to convince. Finally, after much discussion, we have found our ticket to Ligny. This region is one of the main rabbit supply zones, breeding farms as far as the eye can see. Thanks to Mr. Lee's connections, we go into one of them. This farm houses approximately 10,000 animals. Multiple rabbits are often crammed together into one tiny cage. Here, there are no hygiene laws for farm owners. On another farm, we find the same breeding conditions. Animal droppings are left to pile up around the cages. Some of the rabbits show signs of breathing problems. Others have behavioral issues. Tumors. Deformities. For those rabbits destined for luxury, life couldn't get much worse. We are far, far away from Max Mara's elliptical phrase, we can confirm that we only source from certified suppliers. But all this is nothing compared to the death of the animals. Thanks to our fur merchant, we are allowed to enter the Lin Yi slaughterhouse. That noise you can hear is the sound of rabbit screeching. Their legs are often broken as they are hung upside down at the start of the slaughtering process. Next, they are slaughtered. And less than one minute later, they are skinned. These are the skins used in Mr. Lee's factory. This is the fur that ends up covering, amongst other items, our Max Mara jacket. Is this luxury brand aware of the conditions in which these rabbits are forced to live and die? The same rabbits used to make their fur coats? We tried to get an interview with Max Mara, but they refused. Our brand, given the complexity of our supply chain, is unable to provide you with any more information regarding this topic. Interesting logic. As our investigation comes to an end, we no longer see the world of luxury in quite the same way. The tanneries of Tuscany, the breeding farms and slaughterhouses of China. After all of this, we are left with one question. What if this beautiful image of luxury has been nothing but a dream? <laughs>